like to begin each time that I speak with an attempt at humor. So here we go. Dear Dad, it is with great sorrow that I write to you this letter. I'm going to elope with my girlfriend because I want to avoid a scene with you and Mom. I love her. She's perfect, right down to her piercings, tattoos, and multicolored hair. It's not just a passion I have for her. It's something more. She's pregnant with twins. I know you, you don't care for her and you're concerned because she is so much older than me, but she's responsible. She even owns her own campsite out in the woods and a stack of firewood for the whole winter to keep us warm. Of course, she wants to have many more children with me, and that's one of my dreams as well. She has taught me that marijuana isn't really a bad thing. It doesn't hurt anybody. And we'll be growing that in the woods to sustain us. In the meantime, we're praying that science finds a cure for her disease because she really deserves it. Don't worry, Dad. I'm 15, and I know how to take care of myself. Someday, I'm sure you'll be proud of me, and we'll be back to visit so you can meet all of your grandchildren. Love, your son. P.S. Dad. None of the above is true. I'm just at my friend's house, and I wanted to remind you that there are worse things in life than bad grades on a report card. I put mine on your desk. I love you. Call me when it's safe to come home. <laughs> come on, isn't that funny? That's good. That's good. Well, it's good to have you here. We're in the midst of a series called At the Movies. Everybody say that with me. At the Movies. And, and, and uh, this week, we are uh, kind of highlighting for the Alexander... <laughs> Let me read it. And the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. How many of you have ever read that children's book before? Just wave at me for a few moments. How many of you have ever seen the movie? Okay, disclaimer, if you go to watch the movie, there are a couple of things in there that, well, even in PG, I would not uh, recommend, so just be conscientious of that if you watch it with your children. Uh, but there's a couple quotes that I want to uh, mention as we, as we jump in. And uh, as we do that, let me just recap for just a moment. Week one was our Willy Wonka. Do you remember that? And uh, Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, we talked about envy and how to become like Charlie in a Veruca Salt world. And all these messages are online that you can go back and, and watch and invite others to as well. Week two, we talked about Despicable Me and how to overcome the mind minions that are holding you back. Last week, we talked about Star Wars and uh, specifically The Force Awakens, and how vision awakens you to fulfill your destiny. And today I want to talk to you about how (laughs) how to overcome or how to live through a bad day. How many of you have ever had a bad day? Come on, lift your hand, lift your neighbor's hand. We have all experienced them before, and we're going to talk about that for just a few moments and uh, as we jump in. I just want to remind you for the first seven minutes or uh, for the uh, last seven minutes before you leave that you would stay an extra seven minutes, there I'm saying it properly now, and meet some people. We have food afterwards and uh, it's so good for you to go out of your way. You're an amazing person. Other people need to know you. So go out of your way to meet them and uh, that would be great. Also that you'd bring seven friends over these seven weeks to hear uh, the gospel, that God loves them and that for them, and that you'd begin your first seven minutes of your day with God, and you can follow along, uversion.com, uh, with our Hillsong Revival uh, uh, devotional that we're going through. And uh, so I want to jump in. Does everybody have their stress ball? Everybody have their stress ball? This is not to throw at me, by the way. <laughs> Some of you asked on the way in, and uh, after last week got a little bit violent. You saw that spike right over here. I'm not saying any names, Becky, but it was awesome. And... Um, but a stress ball is good. Now, they, they say these stress balls, you have them because if you get stressed out, you're having a bad day, you can just squeeze this, right? Or I prefer sometimes just throw it at the person that you're stressed at. Come on. <laughs> Isn't that true? And so we give, have given this to you. I figured I would start out for a moment and just tell you about one of my bad days. And uh, it was about two years ago, and some of you know this story, but about two years ago, we went on a family vacation, as we always do during this time of year. We uh, got loaded up into our suburban. We were on our way to a better day. Everything was awesome, uh, and it, it was so good. And there's something about vacation, even a thought of it, that gets you excited. Isn't that true? And everything was great, then all of a sudden, it wasn't. Can you relate to those moments? We're driving right down Interstate 95, and it must have been some sort of rock or something 
came off of a truck or maybe, I'm not sure how it got there, but it bounced perfectly and landed right on the sunroof of our Suburban. It hit in a way that it shattered the entire sunroof. Fortunately, we had the inside cover closed and it didn't go all over our children. It was one of those freak accidents that never happened, but it just happened to happen to us as we were driving to Florida. It was, I believe, a Sunday afternoon. Nothing was open. We weren't sure what to do. So we did what any rational person does in a crisis. We went to Walmart. We went and we bought some duct tape and we bought some plastic to put over. And my wife and I, it was hot like today, you know, probably 90 plus degrees. And we went out and the kids are like, what's wrong? We're like, we're like it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's good. You ever like try to be happy and you're not? And we're like, it's fine. Just relax. And I said, honey, we got to get this plastic like really, really tight on top here. And, and so we took a good half hour. I mean, just just getting all the, all, all the edges smooth and, and pulling it up, redoing it, redoing the, all the things, cutting it all out. We said, man, this is perfect. Finally, we got on the road. I'm sweating. We're, we're drenched. I'm like, okay, it'll be fine. We just got to drive the next 15 hours to Florida, and it'll all be good. I could see in the distance the storm clouds, and I got to be honest, I was a little bit nervous, and rightfully so, because we jumped on the Interstate 95. We began uh, to drive along, and then all of a sudden, that great duct tape fixes everything except for your sunroof. It began to flap in the wind. I'm like, oh my, are you kidding me? And so we pull off the side of the road, and I just, I'm singing in worship and glorifying God and having a great moment. And we go side of the road, and they get more tape, and I'm just taping that sucker. I'll just use the whole roll. And we're getting it down there, and, and we get back on the road. We're driving along, and, and about two minutes into that, we hit our top speed going about 70. And, and we hear all the glass kind of going around. And I said, hey, there's nothing we can do. We're just going to have to drive through it. We drove into a storm. The water's pouring into the sunroof. We hear it going off to the sides. It's dripping on my children. They're saying, Daddy, it's wet in here. And I'm thinking, 13 more hours, 14 more hours. We went through storm after storm after storm as the water poured into our suburban, and there was absolutely nothing that we could do. Well, we could have stopped and waited, but who's going to do that? Come on, right? Because we're, we're going on vacation. So we get to the vacation home, which happened to be Tom and Evelyn's. We park the Suburban halfway in the garage just so it stayed out of the rain. I had brought it to a place, and I said, listen, I need to know that you can fix it this week. Can you fix it this week? I believe in being kind, but especially in business, being direct. I said, we can fix it this week. I said, I am leaving on Friday. I'm driving back up the coast of Virginia Beach. I cannot have a repeat of what happened. You can fix it. Yes, we can fix it, sir. I called midweek. How's the car coming along? Hey, it's in. Not a problem. We'll have it done. I called Friday morning. Hey, how's it coming along? They said, no problem. It'll be ready by the time by noon. I said, well, I'm not coming until 5, so there shouldn't be any problems. I got there at 5 o'clock. I looked at my car. I noticed the roof was not in. I said, excuse me, sir. <laughs> Fortunately, you don't know I'm a pastor because right now I'm about to go loco on you, right? And uh, so I said, what is the, what is the deal? And, and she's like, well, we just couldn't. I said, this is really terrible business. I said, I've called here. And they said, well, we could send the sunroof with you if you need to leave because I had to be somewhere the next day. I said, so I can pack the sunroof in the back of my Suburban. That's a great idea. I said, how about you keep the sunroof? I'm just going to call another place. And so we retaped our vehicle, and we began to drive. Guess what happened three minutes into the journey? The, the plastic flew off. Guess what it happened to be doing outside? Raining, and it rained off and on for those 15 hours back up the coast. By the time we got there, my nerves were shot. Every time I heard rain, I kept thinking that my car is going to be flooded, my suburban is going to be ruined, we're not going to have a vehicle, I can't just buy any car because i got five kids. Like, you got to get a tractor trailer to haul them around. And, and I'm stressing out of my mind. The rest of that week, we went and we got it fixed. Every time after that for the next few months, Every time it rained, my nervousness would, would come back in, and I'd look up, and I would kind of check the sunroof, and I'd just make sure that everything was okay. And, and I, would, I would hear rain, and I would think back to that moment. It would kind of stress me out. You know what? Bad moments and bad days, if you're not careful, they can become a bad life. And today I want to teach you 
how to live through a bad day. Because if you learn how to live through a bad day, you can keep it in that moment. And it doesn't need to become your future. And it does not need to become your destiny. So you ready? Turn to your neighbor and tell them it's about to get slap your mama good. Come on, just tell them that if you would. It's about to get slap your mama good. Here's one of the quotes from that book about the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, which was written by Judith Horrush. She said, I went to sleep with gum in my mouth, and now there's gum in my hair. And when I got out of bed in the morning, I tripped on the skateboard by mistake. I dropped my sweater in the sink while the water was running, and I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. How many of you ever had one of those feelings before? <laughs> and then one of the quotes is, I think I'll move to Australia. And then it says, some days are like that, even in Australia. Here's the reality. If you're going to If you're going to be alive, which you are, which is awesome, you need to understand that God is good, but not every day is good. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, it says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The story in that movie is about a family. The little boy woke up. And uh, he wished that everybody would have a bad day, and they all had a terrible day. And that montage from the trailer that you saw earlier, that whole story is about the day going from bad to horrible to worse. And the reality is, is each of us have experienced that very thing in our lives before. I want to take you to a story that's much like that. It's found in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 30. So if you turn with me in your Bibles... As you're turning, there's an old Arab parable that says, all sunshine and no rain makes for a desert. Sometimes you have to experience the bad days to really appreciate the good days. The Bible says in the book of Psalm 23 that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. That valley is a very real valley. It's dark all day except noon when the sun is right over top. It's a valley of uncertainty. They're not sure if there's going to be robbers or thieves that are hiding in the rocks. In the wilderness, it's a place of flash floods because they're not used to having rain. So when the rains come, there's flash floods that occur. You never know what's around the bend. King David, when he wrote that psalm, was talking about that. He was a man that had a lot of good days, but he was also a man that had a lot of bad days. A lot of unfortunate mistakes, a lot of bad choices, and things that happened to him beyond his control. We pick up in his story in 1 Samuel chapter 30. He was anointed to be king, but he was not yet king. Saul, who at one point was was a good king, became an evil king. He no no longer listened to the Lord. In fact, he went to the horoscopes of his day, and and he sought out a psychic or a medium and dishonored the Lord in doing so, so instead of going to God in prayer. So God removed his hand from Saul. Saul would shortly die just a few chapters later, but David was still out and about on the run from King Saul. David was with his mighty men, and they would go out, and they would be at war, and they would fight off different people groups, and then they would come back. They were staying in a town called Ziklag. Everybody say Ziklag. And that's where we pick up with our story. It says, now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were with them from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away, and they went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices, and they wept until they had no more power to weep. Every person that is sucking oxygen today has had a bad day or will have a bad day. You don't need to be a prophet to know that or understand that. God is the God of the good days and the bad days. But you need to learn how to deal with the bad days. Or they quickly become bad weeks, bad months, bad years, and a bad life where we shake our fist at God, say, God, why did you allow this to happen to me? 
and said of God, thank you for taking care of me. David was in a very difficult moment. He and his men had been out, and while they were away, his, his wives, his family, their wives and family, everything that they owned was taken from, from them or destroyed. When they came home, all they did, they saw the ashes all around them. David at that point and the men must have been thinking to themselves, we've lost everything. We've lost our family. David was about to lose his friends because his, his men were ready to turn on him. He, he, he could have in that moment even lost his faith. But I want you to go with me for a few moments. I want you to write these down in your notes or, or, or on the app if you're following along that way and taking notes. Uh, five things that you need to do that we see from the life of David that you need to do, do when you have a bad day. The Bible says that when David and his men saw the ruins, they realized what had happened to their families. And they wept. Everybody say they, they wept. And that picture is snot bubbles, uncontrollably just, just you, know, you know what I'm talking about, where you just overcome with emotion. It, it's a, the same verbiage that's used in the New Testament in John chapter 11 when Jesus, because of the loss of his friend Lazarus, the Bible says Jesus wept or he wept uncontrollably. Here's the first thing that you need to do when you have a bad day. Are you ready? Number one, you need to be honest about how you feel. Saying, oh, it's all good. You know, when you lose someone you love, it's not all good. It's painful. When you have, when you have a business deal fall through, when you have a fight with your spouse, when your kid makes unwise decisions, when, when you thought you're, you were healthy and then all of a sudden this happens or that happens, you're going out with that person and you thought for sure they were the one and then you found out they weren't who you thought they were, that is not a good moment. And sometimes I think uh, we need to respond in faith, but we misunderstand this as followers of Christ. We're told in the Scriptures in this world that we will have trouble. We're going to have bad days, and it is not a, a bad confession to say, you know what, today is terrible. It's an absolutely horrible, bad day. Be honest about how you feel. Be honest with God about how you feel. David was, if you read the book of Psalms, it's David just pouring out his heart to God. And these many songs, he didn't write all the book of Psalms, but he wrote many of them. And he's pouring out his heart saying, God, where are you? And then he would end m many of the Psalms and he would say, but, but God, I trust you. So in those moments when you have a bad day, don't over-spiritualize it. Don't pretend that it's good. Don't say all those things. Just be honest. You know what? It's terrible today. This is how I feel. This is, a, this is a really crappy day. This is a, I wish I would have stayed in bed today. Come on, anybody with me? Can anybody relate to that in those moments? Why didn't I just stay in bed? I wish this day had never happened. Here's a thought. With dependence upon God, allow the emotions of your heart to reflect your pain. God made you with the capacity to grieve because in this life we'd have grief. He made you with the capacity to, to feel pain and all these things because in this fallen world, we experience that. And that's okay. We just don't want to stay there. The Bible says that David and his men, these strong, tough soldiers, the mighty men, warriors, they got on their face and they wept bitterly because everything that was valuable in their lives, they lost. Here's the second thing you need to do when you have moments like, like this. You need to trust in God instead of your feelings. It's okay to have bad feelings. Feelings come and go. Feelings can change in a moment. You might say, man, I just feel depressed today. And you may not even realize that there's country music playing in the background, and that's the reason. You have, I'm teasing. You have no idea. Like, feelings, they come and they go. You need to doubt your doubts, and you need to have faith in God. The Bible says in verse 6, listen to this. It says David. Everybody say David. David. It says David, excuse me, David <clears throat> uh, was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. So you got the picture? Everything was not great in his life. He was anointed to be king, but he's on the run and he's waiting. He's in a season of waiting. 
If you're waiting and wondering, don't worry. Everyone that's ever had anything great happen in their lives has had to wait. Any Bible character, any any story of success, you know, overnight success, there's no such thing as this one day it decided to show up, but they persevered and they had faith through difficulty in dark times. And the Bible says that David was greatly distressed. His friends that were with him, they were talking about stoning him. <laughs> In other words, killing him. They were blaming all of it on David. Now, those are the kind of friends that you don't want. Isn't that true? I mean, when they have a bad day, they blame it all on you. And it says, each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David, listen to this, but David found strength or encouraged himself in the Lord. This is powerful. Just just stop right here. Let's rewind. But David, everybody say David. But David encouraged himself or he trusted and he found strength in the Lord his God. So the Bible tells us in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of struggling, when you don't know what to do, the Bible says this in Proverbs chapter 3. This was written by David's son and uh, his son Solomon. And he learned much of this uh, from the Spirit of God, but from watching his father David. And Solomon said this. He said, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't trust in your circumstance. Don't trust in your fear. Don't trust in your doubt. Don't trust in your pain. Don't put your trust in that person that's walked out of your life when you needed them. Don't trust in the circumstances that are around you. Don't trust what's in your bank account. Don't put your trust in people that could uh, falter and fall in those moments. Put your trust in the Lord your God. (laughs) Trust in the Lord with all of your, of your heart. How much? With all of your heart. In all your ways, acknowledge him. That's what David was doing. Okay, this is a terrible, no good, very bad, horrible day, even in Australia. And God, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm supposed to be king, and I'm supposed to be happy, but my life's going to end today. So, so we, need to, we need to change what we're thinking about. And David changed what he believed. And he made a decision in that moment to not trust in his feelings, but to trust in the Lord. That's how he was able to encourage himself. And here's what you need to know. Other people can inspire you. Other people, but motivating you, that's an inside job. Motivation is something that occurs on the inside and something that you have to choose to awaken within. Now, uh, the Bible tells us to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. To not depend on our own understanding, which is important for David because he's in a place where he just lost everything and he's wondering how God's going to make it good. And it says, seek his will in all that you do and he'll show you which path to take. Here's a thought. You know that you're trusting in God when you choose to worship over your worry. Psalm 34 is one of the Psalms of David. And I don't know if this came to mind at this moment, but I want you to listen to it. As he's laying, crying in the ashes of Ziklag, I believe that this song was coming to his heart. The Bible says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be upon or be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. When you magnify something in your life, you make it bigger than than anything else. If I were to take a penny today, a penny's not very big, but if I magnify it and I get it close to to my eye and I get it close to my eyesight, a penny can block out, that that little penny can block out the entire sun. When you magnify the Lord, man, you let God arise and ultimately your enemies, they will be scattered. He said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from my fears. Worship should be our response 
to difficulty. You know that you're trusting in the Lord in the midst of a bad day when you choose to worship over worry, when you choose to respond in faith over fear, when the words of your mouth says, God, I will praise you at all times, and your words, they'll be continually on my lips. It's not good, but you're not done yet, and you're my God, and your mercies, they endure forever. So today I'm going to encourage myself. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit. Come on. you got to get your fire back. Some of you may be here today, and you're in the ashes of Ziklag. You're in a moment where it seems like things have been stolen from you. You're in the midst of a very bad day. I want to challenge you. Today, make a decision to begin to worship. Because the God that created you, He can create newness out of that situation. And He can bring back everything the enemy has stolen. Here's number three. This is what David did. Listen to this. Then David, everybody say David. Then David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, he said, bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? In other words, he, he, he took something for us that's like going to a prayer closet uh, with your Bible. For them, they had what was known as an, as an ephod, or something they brought with them. It was also something that the priest would put on. And he said, basically, I need to get into a position so I can get into a possession. I need to get into a place where I can hear from God so I ultimately can receive what God has for me. And so he, he didn't get on Facebook. He, he didn't whine about it. He, he didn't run to his friends because his friends were trying to kill him. He ran to the Lord, his God. And he said, God, I'm going to encourage myself with, with your promises, which I know are true. I, I'm going to remind myself of being a young shepherd boy when you anointed me and I defeated Goliath. I'm going to remind myself of the day that I was called in, and Samuel the prophet held that horn of oil over me, and that wax seal began to dissipate, and that oil flowed, and I was called to be king. God, I'm going to remember the day that you exalted me in the eyes of the people, and God, I know that you have a plan and that you have a purpose for me. So today, I'm going to remember that, and I'm going to ask of you. See, here's the reason that we don't talk to God Whenever we go through difficulty, the reason is, is we don't trust Him. Because if we trust Him, we'll talk to Him about it. We'll say, hey, God, I know this is not my future, so what do you want me to do in the present? God, I know this is not the end of the story, so what is the next page that needs to be turned? God, I know that you're for me, and it doesn't matter who or what may be against me. Father, I know I'm a child of the Most High God. So today, God, what do you want me to do? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. How do you make it through a bad day? You need to ask God what to do before making a decision, before calling that lifelong friend before going all those ways, those humbly coming before God. Spirit of God, speak to you. Speak to me. What do you want me to do? The Bible says in James 1, 5, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God. And he'll give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Don't run to Walmart. Don't go get duct tape to fix everything. Go ultimately to your heavenly Father. God, what do you want me to do? I'm going through divorce and it's painful. God, what do you want me to do? I'm going through this issue and it's difficult. What do you want me to do? God, I'm going through bankruptcy and I'm embarrassed. God, what do you want me to do? Verse 17. The Bible says, listen to this. David. Everybody say, David. Come on, like you had a Red Bull this morning. Everybody say, David. It says, David fought them. He went after these men and he fought against them. From dusk until evening of the next day. And not one of them got away except for 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything. Everybody say everything. See, someone needs to hear that today. 
Because you think, well, you know what, I just want a little bit of my life to be okay. And, and it's been difficult. And, and I don't know, you know, if I'll ever get back to where I was before. And I've had this and I've had that. You need to know something. That in the ashes of Ziklag, when David turned his heart, he felt his feelings, but he didn't follow them. And as he got with God and he asked him and he trusted him and he worshipped over worrying. And as we went back, all of a sudden he said, you know what, i got to get some fight back in me, and I need to keep the enemy from stealing my future. His future was his children. His future was his family. His future was his men's family, and he knew that. So he didn't sit there sucking his thumb in fetal position saying, oh, God must hate me. It's the end of my life. He got up and said, I'm a warrior. I'm called, and I'm chosen, and Satan, you cannot have my family. Satan, you cannot have my wealth. You cannot have my future. And he fought the enemy, and God brought him victory. Someone needs to hear today that you need to get your fight back, and you need to take back what God has already provided for you. Well, the enemy's taking my health. Well, it's time to fight. The enemy's taking my marriage. It's time to fight from morning to the next day. David fought, and God brought him victory. And if God will do it for him, come on, he'll do it for you. Push your neighbor and just tell him right now he's talking about you. Come on, encourage him if you would. The Bible says that nothing was missing. Young, I love this, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else that they had taken. David brought everything. Everybody say everything. Everything. Brought everything back. Oh, but, but people don't like me, and this happened. I lost my reputation, and I lost this, and I lost that. You need to know something, that God is able to empower you, to give you strength, to take that bad day and make a lot of great days out of it, to make it take a bad season and to create and make a great life. You have the power to choose. How do you live through a bad day? Well, you've got to keep the enemy from stealing your, your future. You got to fight for your right to power. Okay, that's not, that's a different one. Okay. Uh, Let me just say this for a moment. Will you fight for your life from that medical report? For your job? For your marriage? Will you fight for your role as husband or wife? Mother, father, brother, or sister in Christ? Will you fight for your right? to be a kingdom person full of the blessing and favor of God, even in the midst of difficulty. There's a difference between willing to die for something and a willingness to fight for it. I often hear men say, man, I would die for my wife. That's good. Well, you take her on a date. Come on. Will you fight for her? That thing in your life, man, will you go and ask God, And say, this is bitter, but God, I know you're going to make it better. So I'm not staying here in the ash pile. I'm going to get up, and I'm going to take back my future. I'm going to take back what God has for me. That's why we have conferences and Pathway of Purpose and small groups and next steps and and groups like Restoration and others to help you, to encourage you, to equip you, to let you know that the season that you're in is not the season that you'll stay in. God has more in store for you. He's a God of abundance. 1 John 4, 4 says, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come to give you and I life and life more abundantly. We live in a broken world, but we overcome evil not by doing evil. We overcome evil by doing good. Here's the last thought I want to give you. Verse 22 says, All the evil men and troublemakers among David's followers said, (laughs) There's always a Judas at the table. Isn't that true? Just because someone's good to you doesn't mean they're good for you. There are some people in your world that you cannot allow into your inner circle. 
See, the people that are closest to you, they determine your destiny, they determine your future. They'll be the ones closest to you in the midst of difficulty, discouragement, and fear. They'll either speak life to you or death, and that voice can override that verse that God has for you. That's why you need to qualify the people that you have in your world. Love everybody, but keep those clothes that God has ordained for you. And how do you know that God's ordained them for you? Do they love you and love God? Do they give up on you in the midst of difficulty, or do they come closer? Because, listen, real friends walk in when others walk out. So David had these people in his life. I think it's funny. David's mighty man, all these good people. But there are some evil men, there are some troublemakers among David's followers. They said, because they did not go out with us. Speaking of others that stayed back and did not go to find uh, and, and fight, they said, they will not have any share with them to the plunder we've recovered. However, each man may take his wife and children and go. In other words, hey, you didn't go and fight with us? You don't get any of the blessings. It's just for us. And then David said, hold on. I have something to say. Listen to what he said. He said, no, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. They thought they had given it to themselves. But they hadn't given themselves victory. God had given them victory. That means that everything that is in your life is something that God wants to use and get through you to be a blessing to build God's kingdom and to build other people's world through the gifts that God has given you. He said, he has protected us and delivered us into our hands, the raiding party that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of who went down to the battle. All will share alike. It is more blessed to give than receive, Acts 20, 35 says. Proverbs 11 says, the world of the generous grows larger and larger, but the world of the stingy grows smaller and smaller. One day in the near future, we will build a beautiful building where people will come from all over to gather. And generations will be changed, baptized, people will be saved, and, and the world will be impacted for the glory of God. Now, it's happening today, but it will happen at another location. And in the future, we'll do it for one of our other campuses. We'll build a building there. And you know what? Every person that walks through the door, they're going to come in and experience the freedom of life that only God has to offer. And you know what we're not going to say? Hey, well, we sacrificed and paid for that building. You can't be here. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to celebrate and say, you know what, God, thanks for blessing us so that now we can be a blessing to the world and we can pass this generation to generation to generation. We're going to set up our children's children's children for success. We're going to build an ark for the saving of our families. Everything you've given to us, God, is not just for us. It's to bless the world. So here's the last thought. Keep a positive and generous spirit because when you go through difficulty, when you go through difficulty, it can put you in a place, well, that God hasn't called you to be. Today I want to encourage you, as we close, would you stand with me? Jack Hayford, who's an incredible gift to the body of Christ, well along in years, an amazing man of God, who's faced much difficulty in his life, he said this, he said, to live through a bad day, indeed, to conclude it, is to place it into the hands of God and to leave it there. If we're not careful, we can carry our bad, carry our bad days and our bad moments. And we can affect and infect every day for the rest of our lives. In 1987, I remember sitting like many... Others of you, some of you weren't born yet. Where's the people that weren't born yet? 1980, just wave at me. 1987, you weren't born yet. Just want to do that to make us all feel old that were. But those of you that heard, were born, you remember. Now, uh, news is at your fingertips. But it used to be whatever was on nightly news or on TV, that's what you knew about, whatever was in the paper. That's what kind of drove everybody's attention. 
1987, I remember as a child, a young teen, sitting captivated, as many others were, they were attempting to rescue a little 18-month-old girl that had fallen 22 feet into a well. She had gotten lodged into a shaft only 8 inches in diameter. We stayed glued to the television, even into the night. Watched again early the next morning as we hoped and the country prayed so that many others, excuse me, so that ultimately this little girl's life would end well. The nation willed the equipment to open up a parallel path to our location. Prayed for strength that the workers who had not had any sleep in their effort to deliver the little girl back to their family could continue on. And for 58 hours, the news channels everywhere kept the nation in suspense and informed, telling reporters about this little girl. For much of that time, baby Jessica was stuck underground. She let those with an earshot know that she was still alive. She moaned, she wailed, and for a little while, she even sang nursery rhymes to pass the time. As oxygen was pumped down to the shaft to give her air, people kept calling, baby Jessica, hoping for a response. Even though the situation was grim, her sweet little voice kept singing songs. And along with her cries and moans, it let everyone know that she was still there. And it was worth the hard work of what they were doing, trying to figure out how to reach this precious little girl. We'll never forget the epic scene. I don't know if we have that picture or not, but of baby Jessica being brought out before the world, being rescued. She had lost one of her toes, and she had uh, been just uh, in a very bad way. But since then, she's grown up. She's had a great life, and blessed, and family, and children, and, and all those different things. I share that story as we close to let you know that to our darkest moments, they're only a moment. <laughs> Years later, later, Jessica said she doesn't even remember that experience from what people she even shared with her, except for a scar on her forehead and from a missing baby toe. She's just fine. Even though she was hurt and she was bruised, she continued to sing. And she was rescued out of that pit. And that moment did not define her life. But she stepped into the future that God had for her. And that, my friends, is exactly what God desires to do in your life today. Not throw you down a well and have you trapped there for 58 hours. God desires to rescue you no matter where you are. To set your feet upon the rock. To give you mourning for dancing. To let a new hope arise on the inside of you. To rebirth vision and passion. And to not allow your life to be, to be de- determined by a mistake or a difficulty. But to trust in the Lord that His ways, they are good. Would you bow your Hey, thanks so much for tuning in to our online experience. It's our prayer that you experience the freedom and life that only God has to offer. I want you to know that God loves you, that He's for you, and as you trust in Jesus, your greatest days are out in front of you. If there's anything we can do to support you or encourage you, don't hesitate to email us at hope at freedomlife.tv. Thanks so much for tuning in once again. Have a great day.